Good to see all of you. Thanks so much for being here today. And uh, to those of you watching online, great having you joining in as well. And uh, as you can see, today we're going to be continuing on in our series that we started last week, Man on a Mission, where we're going to be going passage by passage through the book of Luke. So we're going to be here a while uh, in this series, and I'm so excited because what better way for us to discover what it means to find and follow Jesus than to study his life, uh, and we're going to be doing that through the book of Luke. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Luke chapter chapter 1 and verse 26, uh, and we're going to be starting there today. The title of our message is Working the Plan. Working the Plan, Luke 1, 26. Now, as I meet people and get to know them, I find that most people uh, kind of fall into one of two categories when it comes to a certain characteristic. You've got those people who are what I would call your spontaneous people. Any spontaneous people in here today? Um, some of you are spontaneously raising your hands. That's great. Um, but uh, we got our spontaneous people. These are the people that would prefer not to live life on a schedule. Um, they would rather just be able to wake up in the morning and do whatever they want to do as life comes at them. In fact, these are the kind of people that might wake up in the morning and say, hey, let's go on a road trip today. And you're like, where are we going? I don't know, but let's do it. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be fun. And uh, when you take these people and you try to you try try to put them in a schedule and you try to schedule their whole life, it can be really frustrating for them because they feel kind of constrained and kind of weighed down by the scheduling. And so they don't, they don't like that schedule all the time. They would prefer to just take like life as it comes to be flexible and just enjoy the moment that they're in. Then there's others of us, notice I say us because I'm in this category, that I would call planners, all right? We got any planners in here, all right? And then we got a whole bunch of you that just decided not to participate, all right? You're either, a, you're either spontaneous or you're a planner or you're a non-participator, okay? But um, for those of us who are planners, all right, if you're like me, you wake up in the morning and you know where you're going, you know what you're going to do, you know what time you need to be there, and if everything works out according to plan, you know exactly what what you're going to do and how you're going to spend every minute of your day. Uh, for, for these people, the planning, the scheduling isn't something that makes them feel weighed down or constrained, but it's actually something we enjoy. We like being able to have that schedule because it helps us to, to feel free to know where we're supposed to be and what we're supposed to be doing. And, and for me, having that schedule just is a way for me to make sure that I'm not missing anything. I want to make the most of every moment. And so having that schedule seems to help me do that. Now, you know, as an example of me being this kind of scheduled type of person, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you into what Sunday mornings look like a little bit for me. So I show up on Sunday mornings at least by 6.30 every Sunday, all right? Six, in fact, if I'm here at 6.30, I'm actually a little later than I like to be. But by 6.30, I'm here at the church every Sunday. And uh, the first thing I do when I get here, and this is going to sound really unspiritual of me as your pastor, so please forgive me ahead of time. The first thing I do when I get here is not like spend time praying over the service or spend time like going over my sermon notes or anything like that. The first thing I do when I get here is go to my desk, sit down and write my to-do list for the week. <laughs> All right, it's what I do because, because I found that when I come on Sunday morning, if I don't sit down and I write my to-do list for the week so I know what I need to get done this week, I know when I've got my meetings, I know when I've, when I've got to make a phone call, I know the people I need to connect with. If I don't sit down and do that Sunday morning's first thing, then I'll be distracted all morning trying to think about, oh, I've got to remember this later, I've got to remember this later. If I just write it down, it helps me be so much more focused on what I need to do here. So I, I sit down first thing Sunday mornings when I get here, I sit down and I write my to-do list for the week. Now that might sound a little weird, but being a planner, that really helps me. Now, we, we, as a planner, we've got all kinds of kind of what I would call maybe proverbs or general wisdom that we say in our culture uh, about planning. Um, and these things are, as a planner, things that I just, I really grab onto. You've got your things that, that say something like, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail, right? So let's make a good plan. If you fail the plan, you plan to fail. Uh, a second one uh, that that's what my football coach used to say all the time when it came to football. He's getting ready to play a team this week. He's like, we got to make a good plan for how we're going to how we're gonna play this team, their defense, their offense, all that kind of stuff. And so he would say things like this. we got to plan our work this week, and then we got to work our plan. All right? And that's, that's as we get into today's passage, what we find is, is the starting of the working out of God's plan. We, we find the starting of the working out of God's plan for Jesus to come to this earth that he planned long 
long, long ago. And, and, and finally, we're here at this point in Luke chapter 1. And, and in this time and space in history, God is going to start working his plan for Jesus to come to this earth. And what we find as we look at this passage of Scripture, what the emphasis that, that Luke gives here to this beginning portion of Scripture is that Jesus is the fulfillment of all of God's promises for you. All of God's promises for you. Jesus is the fulfillment. If you want to experience all that God wants for your life, you've got to find it in Jesus because apart from Jesus, we can't have any connection. We can't have any relationship with God apart from Jesus. And so in Jesus, we find the fulfillment of what God has for us in every way. And so, so what we see in Luke chapter 1 and starting in verse 26... It says this, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from, a, from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Now, don't worry, it's not Christmas yet. You still got time to get your Christmas shopping done. But we're here, Luke 1. We, we get into this, this beginning stages of God revealing the coming of Jesus, and this is a powerful portion here. I love as we look at this passage of scripture, there's a few things that Luke makes sure to point out. He says, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel. So the sixth month, this is, as we're going to find out a few verses later, six months after Elizabeth has her visitation from God, or excuse me, uh, 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 Zachariah has his visitation from the angel of God that says Elizabeth's going to get pregnant. And Elizabeth gets pregnant. This is six months after Elizabeth uh, has gotten pregnant. We talked about that last week. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel, the same angel that went and announced to Zechariah that Elizabeth was going to be pregnant, comes to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Now, for us, the word Nazareth just means this is where Mary lived. I mean, that's about all we, most of us probably know about it because we're not from this part of the world. But what we know about the city of Nazareth, or really I should probably better say the town of Nazareth, or maybe even better yet, the village of Nazareth, is that it was really nothing special. There was, there was really nothing special about Nazareth. Nazareth was kind of in the northern part of Israel, and, and uh, it, was, it was close to a trade route, but it was kind of off the beaten path a little bit. Um, and, and so estimates vary of how large uh, Nazareth would have been at this time frame, but it was not a large city. It was not a powerful place. It was not an influential place in this time frame. And in, 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 in when this happens, Nazareth is just kind of that small town that's out there so Somewhere that people who are local and people who are from the area kind of know about it, but a lot of people who might not be from around there don't really know much about it. And so Nazareth is kind of this off the beaten path place that, that, that's nothing really that special. And it says the, the angel comes to Nazareth um, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph. Now I find this really interesting. The angel makes the announcement to Mary that she's going to become pregnant and she's going to give birth to Jesus. But whose name is mentioned first? Joseph's. All right, it mentions Joseph's name first. It says, the angel comes to a virgin who was betrothed to be married to, uh, who was betrothed to Joseph. This, this man, Joseph, who was, a, who was from the house of David, from the line of David. Now, now this, this points out a couple things. First of all, Mary wasn't a well-known girl at this point. If she would have been, they would have named her first. Uh, and Luke would have made a, made a point to say, hey, the angel Gabriel visited this very influential woman, Mary. But Mary wasn't an influential woman. She was just a girl from a small town. In fact, how betrothal worked, uh, uh, the, this process of getting married in, in uh, Jesus' day, in this time frame of history, uh, Mary was likely, could have been as young as 12 years old. That's right around the time when a lot of Jewish girls would get betrothed to be married. And usually the process of getting married for them started with um, 
with the man coming to the, the bride's family and paying the bride price to be betrothed. And there was this official betrothal period that oftentimes lasted a year or longer sometimes even. And, and in this period of betrothal, this is a little bit different than engagement for us. I mean, we get engaged in our, in our day and age and, and it's, it's looking forward to the wedding, it's planning for the wedding, it's all of those kinds of things. But in Jesus' day, in this time of history, a betrothal was about as good as a marriage to the point that if you were going to break a betrothal, it was about the same thing as getting a divorce. There were legal things involved in breaking a betrothal. It wasn't just like, hey, I decided not to marry you anymore. There was, there was some very real consequences to this. So Mary, this unknown girl from this off the beaten path place in Israel, gets a visit from an angel. And I find this really interesting because if you can think of all the people that God could choose to, to have be the mother of Jesus, he chooses the unknown girl in the unknown place that nobody knows that's already betrothed to be married to another man, to Joseph. And, and as I think about this, it hits me, it strikes me, because the person that Jesus or that God chose to use to bear the, to become the mother of Jesus, the person that God chose to use was no one special. The Bible doesn't say that Mary was, was well known. It doesn't say anything about her other than that she was a girl from a town in Nazareth. Now, of course, to this day, we know who Mary is. We know the in, in incredibly important role she plays in the story of Jesus. We know that, that, that she was an incredibly important person. But at this point, when the angel shows up, she's not. And in fact, the Bible doesn't give us any sense that there was anything special about Mary other than the fact that God chose to use her. Other than the fact that God chose to use Mary, there's nothing that we know about her that would set her apart from anyone else. And, and as we look at this, I think the reality that we can grasp onto and that we can hold onto is no matter who you are or where you come from, Jesus is for you. You might, feel like, you might feel like a nobody from a small town that nobody knows about. You might feel like, I'm just a normal person. I'm just an average person. I'm, just, so I'm nobody special. But let me just tell you that even if you feel that way, that you're nobody special, that you, you don't come from a special place, you don't come from the right family, you don't have the right background, you're not a prominent person in any way, let me just tell you that God wants to show up in your life as well, and he wants to announce the coming of Jesus in your life as well. He wants Jesus to become a part of your life. He wants Jesus to dwell within you as well. Mary wasn't somebody special. She wasn't somebody that, that we knew anything about, but God chose to use her. God chose to work out his plan through her. And let me just tell you this morning, you might think, I'm nobody special. I don't have much going for me, but God can choose to use you. And in fact, he wants to choose to use you to work out his plans and purposes in your life and through your life as well. You see, no matter who you are or no matter where you come from, God wants to use you, and the beginning point of God using you is recognizing that we need to make that turn towards Jesus. Jesus is for you. He's for me. He's for each one of us. It doesn't matter what our background is. It doesn't matter what our history is. We might be the most prominent person, or we might be the least well-known person, but whatever your story is, Jesus wants to enter into your story just like he entered into Mary's. Jesus made a real difference in this world. And he wants to make a real difference in your world. So we continue on here in verse 28. It says, And he came to her, the angel came to, to Mary, and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. Now let's just recognize this greeting. Uh, when, when the angel says, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. He's, he's giving a greeting to this, this young girl who's, who's probably frightened because as we see anywhere in the Bible, when, when somebody interacts with an angel, they tend to be scared. And so the angel says, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. And verse 29 is interesting. It says, But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. The way the angel greets her is what troubles Mary. It says, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. Why would that greeting trouble her? Well, putting myself in her shoes, I can imagine she's thinking like, why would you call me a favored one? I'm just a small girl from a small town. Nobody really knows who I am. 
And so, so why would you call me the favored one? And that's part of it, but I think also we have to recognize that Mary uh, was, was in a Jewish community. She was a Jewish woman. And as a Jewish woman, she would have undoubtedly known and understood and had studied the scriptures. She would have heard them from the time she was a young child. From, from over and over again, on a regular basis, she would have had the stories of Israel, the stories of the Old Testament spoken to her, told to her, taught to her over and over again. And one of the things that we find that's kind of an echo here in, in this verse is that when the, an angel appears to somebody in the Old Testament to speak to them about how God wants to use them in a significant way, the angel often greets them in a way similar to the way, he greets, uh, to the way Gabriel greets Mary. The Lord is with you. You're a favored one. Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. Those, that language that the Lord is with you is an indication. Remember, at this point, Mary doesn't know what's going on. She just knows that there's this angel here. What's happening? And the angel says here, greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. In her mind, I think what we see here is that Mary is troubled at this greeting because she recognized that those are words that are not just spoken to any person. Those are words that are spoken to somebody that God wants to use in a powerful way throughout the history of Israel in the Old Testament. And I think at this very moment, I can't prove it to you exactly, but I think at this very moment, the reason that Mary was troubled at this greeting is because she's recognizing this angel showing up and this angel speaking to me, saying, the Lord is with me and I'm a favored one. What is God about to do? What's God about to do? Have you ever had that sense of being troubled a little bit when you know that God's up to something, but you don't know what he's about to do? I think that's where Mary's at right now. And so, continuing on, it says, she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. And he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and, his, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I'm a virgin? Now there's a few things that are emphasized here. First of all, it's emphasized a couple of times that Mary's a virgin. So this child is going to be a miraculous child. Okay, I, we don't need to get into the nitty gritty details, but we all know how kids are made. And we know that Mary doesn't have that kind of experience. And yet she's about to have the son of God. She's about to, to be pregnant with the Son of God. This is a miraculous event. This isn't something that just happened by accident. This is something that could only have happened if it was planned and, and, and worked out by God himself. So Mary recognizes that, or we can recognize that in this, in Mary. But the second thing we can recognize is that there's this repetition in verse, uh, in verse 28, it, or excuse me, 27, it talks about Joseph of the house of David. And it talks about this here again. It says, um, in verse 32, he will be great. He will be called the son of the most high and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David. What in the world does David have to do with this? That's a question we can ask. What in the world does David have to do with this? David was a great hero of the faith for the Jewish people. He was a man who, who slayed the giant Goliath. He was a king of Israel. He was this great ruler, a man uh, that in scripture is known as a man after God's own heart. He wasn't a perfect man by any means. He sinned in some great ways and caused great distress upon his family in, in some of the decisions he made. But, but what we know about David is he was a man whose heart was for God. And, and even in his mistakes, he would turn back to God and he would, he would try to serve God and he would try to live for God in the best ways that he could. But this is literally hundreds of years before Mary's ever, before Mary's ever on the scene. Why is David such an important part of this. And the reason David is such an important part of this is because what Luke's trying to show us is that this wasn't just some random event that God decided and said, you know what? I think this is what we're going to do now. We're going to, I'm going to send my son and he's, he's going to go, okay, so where's, uh, let's pick Mary. Okay, here, let's do this. This wasn't some spur of the moment, off the cuff plan that God came up with. This was planned long ago and we know this because we can turn all the way back to 2 Samuel chapter 7. 
In verse uh, 16, and, and this, is, uh, this is a prophet of God, Nathan, speaking to David. And he says to David, this is a promise that God gives to David through a prophet. He says, and your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. In accordance with all these words and in accordance with all this vision, Nathan spoke to David. In other words, what we see here is that hundreds of years before Jesus had even come, God spoke to his people and said, listen, I'm going to send somebody who's going to be the king of Israel. He's going to be the king over all that I have created. I'm going to send somebody, and this isn't going to be a king in the earthly sense, a king that's going to raise up to power and who's going to rule over a plot of land, and and it's just going to be an earthly king, and he's going to live, and then he's going to die, and that's going to be the end of it. What God says to David is he says, listen, through you, through your ancestors, there's going to rise up somebody who's going to take the throne and who's going to be the king, not just the king over Israel, but the king over all of creation. And this king is going to reign forever and forever and ever and ever. And this king is one that you can serve. This king is one that you can know. This king is going to be from the line of David. What Luke is trying to show us as he repeats this this fact about David, that Joseph's from the line of David and that Jesus is going to be the king over all the, all, all, all the king of David that was promised to come over all of the earth that we know that this was planned from the very beginning. You see, it could seem like the plan of God was starting to be worked out in Luke chapter 1, but the fact of the matter is Jesus was God's plan A from the very beginning. He wasn't God's plan B. From the very beginning, all throughout the Old Testament, we see that there's a promise of a coming rescuer, a coming deliverer. There's a promise that somebody's going to come and make right what was, what was made wrong in the Garden of Eden. And from the very beginning, that person was planned to be Jesus. The angel is announcing to Mary, listen, this promise that you've held on to, this promise that's been out there for hundreds of years is about to come to pass. And it's going to come to pass through this child that you're going to bear. And as we look at this, it's important for us to recognize that Jesus has always been the foundation of God's plan for your life. Jesus has always been the foundation of God's plan for your life. He wasn't plan B. God didn't look at at some decision you made at some point and think, man, how am I going to fix this? What are we going to do now? What can I do to to, to try to enter into this situation? From the very beginning, before you were even born, before you were even conceived in your mother's womb, God's plan for you was to know Jesus. And he's starting to bring that plan into fruition in Mary right now. God's plan for each and every one of us was Jesus. He's always been the plan for your life. Jesus has always been God's plan for you. And that's why we at New Life talk about how our mission is to help people find and follow Jesus because from the very beginning, God's plan was that though we we had broken our relationship with him through our decision to live our lives our way instead of God's way, that Jesus was going to come and he was going to be the answer. Jesus was going to come and he was going to provide the solution that we couldn't have in and of ourselves. And Jesus was going to be the foundation. This was planned from the very beginning. Jesus didn't just come as a man who happened to be a really good guy and was a really great teacher that somehow ascended to this place of being the Messiah. Jesus was planned from the very beginning. And he came here as a man on a mission. He came here with purpose. He came here with intentionality. And Jesus came to accomplish God's plan for your life and for mine. And we see that starting to be worked out in Mary. We continue on in verse 35. It says, the angel said to her, the Holy, or Mary had asked, how will this happen since I'm a virgin? And the, the angel answers her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be, bo- be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth is in her, in her old age, has conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. So we get to this next section here. And, and I think there's something very real that happens with a lot of us. When we think about the fact that God has a plan for us, 
and we think about the fact that God's plan is, is founded in Jesus, I think we, we can have this tension. We, we, can, we can recognize what God has done for us, but we can also recognize what we've done to ourselves. We can also recognize the ways that we've chosen to live our life apart from what God would have wanted. We can recognize the ways that we have chosen to live our life and run away from God's plans or his purposes or his desires for us. And I think sometimes what happens when it comes to following Jesus, we can be afraid and we can be scared that somehow we're going to mess up God's plan for our life. Somehow a decision I make is going to completely mess up God's plan and I'm going to find myself in a position where there's no longer any hope for me because I've decided to do things, to make decisions, to, to follow a path that led me away from God and there's no longer any hope for me. Sometimes we can feel that way. Sometimes we can be afraid to step out and to, to make a decision because we can be paralyzed by this fear of, I don't want to mess up God's plan. I don't want to mess up what God wants to do in me. I don't, want to, I don't want to mess it up. Sometimes we're afraid to be used by God. We say, God, I love you. I, I want to serve you. But guess what? If you're, if you're asking me to make a difference in somebody's life, I'm not sure I can do that. I'm going to mess it up somehow because I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not equipped in the right ways. We can become scared because we can wonder and we can start to think that God's plan somehow depends on me. God's plan depends on you. It depends on me. We can become scared and afraid that somehow I'm going to mess up what God's plan is. And Mary asked the same question. Uh, angel, how's this possible? I'm a virgin. This isn't going to work. And the angel makes it clear. He says, listen, this plan of God is going to come to pass in your life because of God's power and God's work, not because of anything you can do. Because of what God can do in your life, because of what God is going to accomplish in you, Jesus is going to come to this earth. That's what he speaks to Mary. And I think God wants to speak the same thing to some of us today. Listen, you may have made mistakes. You may have fallen off the path. You may have gone in a direction that God never wanted or intended for you to go. And you might find yourself asking the question, God, did I mess up your plan for my life? God, is it too far? Am I too far gone? Is it too late for me? Is there anything that I can do to, to make it back to what you have for me. And to you, I would say this morning, God wants to speak to you and say, listen, God accomplishing his plans and his purposes in, his, in your life depends on his power, not on yours. God wants to do great things in you. God wants to do great things through you. We speak those things over you all the time because we believe them. And I believe God wants to do incredible things through your lives. But what if I mess it up? Listen, it doesn't rely on your power. It's all in God's power. The angel speaks to Mary and says, listen, this isn't going to happen because of anything you can do. This is simply going to happen because God's power is going to be activated in your life. And let me just tell you this morning, if you want to see God's plan come to pass in you, then it's going to happen when you allow God to activate his power in your life. It's not up to you to make it happen. It's not up to you to be smart enough or good enough or, or, or equipped enough or any of those things. God's power is what makes the difference. God's power is what makes the difference. You see, your main role in God's plan is to be changed by Jesus and to point people to him. To allow God to do the work and then just point people to the one who did it. That's what your main role is. You don't have to be powerful enough or influential enough or any of those things. You just have to lean into God's power and say, God, I'm going to trust in you to accomplish it. But it doesn't end there. In Luke 138, we close off this passage and it says, Mary said, behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. And this is a profound verse. Because Mary understood, she would have known what this means, that she's going to become pregnant as she's betrothed to be married to Joseph. She's going to become pregnant. Mary would have known the potential consequences that could have come from this. Mary would have known that Joseph's going to be well aware this isn't his child. Mary would have known that there was the possibility that, that she would be socially ridiculed, yes, but there was also the possibility that she could have been stoned, she could have been killed for adultery. Mary understood the implications of becoming pregnant outside of her relationship with jo Joseph and outside of being married, with him, married to him. And what's her response? God, I'm your servant. Do what you want to do with me. 
You see, while being used by God and seeing his plans and his purposes come to pass in our life relies on God's power, it also requires our, our willingness to participate. It requires our, our willingness to just say, God, do what you want to do in me and do what you want to do through me. It's not up to your power to make it happen, but it's up to your cooperation with God. You can cooperate with him or you can fight against him. And as we look at, at Mary's response, this is a profound response. Mary understood that following God's plan for her life in this moment might cost her something. Following God's plan for her life could, could have put her off into a completely different future than she had planned for herself, than she was thinking about. But how does she respond? She says, God, I know the potential cost. I know what could happen for this, but I'm your servant. Do what you want to do. And what a profound thought for us. As God wants to work out his plan in you and in me, as God wants Jesus to be glorified in our lives, what a profound response that would be if we would all say the same thing. God, whatever you want to do, I'm your servant. Do what you want to do. You see, following Jesus requires you submit yourself to him completely. Not just in the areas you're comfortable with, not in just the ways you say, well, God, I'll follow you in every area, but this one I'd like control of myself. No, following Jesus requires that you submit yourself to him completely. God, I'm yours. I'm yours completely. I'm your servant. Do what you want to do with me. And let me just tell you that if we can learn to, to, to come to this place where we recognize, God, it's your power, it's your, it's your greatness, it's your, it's your, your, your working in me that's going to accomplish your will, I'm just going to say yes to whatever you ask me to do. If we come to that place where we can recognize those two truths and we can hold those truths and we can live those two truths, then guess what? Jesus is going to be glorified through you and you will become a part of God's plan to see his will accomplished in this world. You will see God accomplishing his plan to lift up Jesus in the lives of your friends and your family members and your neighbors and your co-workers. You'll see Jesus invading your life and invading situations where you didn't know what was supposed to happen or you didn't know what decision to make and Jesus can enter into those things and he can do the miraculous in those places just like he does throughout his life and as is recorded for us through the book of Luke as Jesus enters into the situation he makes all the difference and Jesus wants to enter into your life and he wants to make all the difference in you so the challenge for each one of us is very simple you need to center your life on Jesus you need to center your life on Jesus. Well, what's God's plan for my life? God, what, what do you have for me? What's, 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 what's the, 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 the details of all of God's plan for me? I can't tell you all the ins and outs, but I can tell you this. God's plan for you starts and ends in Jesus. And God's plan for you is accomplished in Jesus and God's plan for you is going to glorify and lift up Jesus. Apart from Jesus, we're missing it. So you need to center your life on Jesus. And as you center your life on Jesus, as you center your life on him and what he has for you and the plans and purposes he wants to work out in your life and you rely on his power and as you, as you, as you walk that out, let me just say that you're going to join the mission that Jesus was about. Jesus came because he loved you, he loved me. Jesus came to bring a reconciliation, to bring a, a, a restoring of our relationship with God. And as you say yes to Jesus, he's gonna send you on a mission to help others discover who he is. So right now, we're gonna prepare to take communion together because I think communion is a very appropriate way for us to reflect on centering our lives on Jesus. So right now I want to go ahead and invite our, our communion hosts to come forward and, and uh, start preparing to pass out the communion elements. But as they do that, I want you to ask yourself this question. If I were Mary, what would my response be? God, if you're going to do this big thing, would I resist it? Would I say, no, I don't want to do that? Or would I say, God, how am I going to figure this out? How am I going to make it happen in my power? Or instead, would you just be willing to say, Jesus, I'm going to rely on your power, and I'm going to say yes to you and cooperate with whatever you would ask of me. 
Communion hosts, you can go ahead and start passing out the elements. And as they do, our worship team's going to go ahead and lead us. And as they lead us in this song once more, I want to encourage you to ask yourself this question. How can I center my life on Jesus? What areas of my life have I gotten off center? Have I, have I centered my life or founded my life upon something else? And as our communion hosts pass out the elements, I want to invite all followers of the Lord Jesus to feel free to take communion with us. In a couple minutes, we'll come back together and we'll take communion together as a, as a new life family. But in the meantime... As they're passing out the elements, ask yourself this question, God, how can I center my life on you? Jesus, how can I center my life on you? If Jesus was the plan from the very beginning, if Jesus was the plan from hundreds and thousands of years ago before Mary was even born, if Jesus was the plan that God wanted to work in me and through me, then how can I rely on Jesus's power and how can I say yes to whatever Jesus would ask me to do to be a part of what God wants to do in this world and Respond like Mary did. Say, yes, Lord, I'm your servant. Whatever you have, I will follow you. So Jesus, we just give you the next few moments. I pray that as we spend some time in worship and as we prepare to take communion, that you would speak to each one of us. That if there's any areas of our lives where we've gotten off center, where we haven't, haven't followed you and we haven't, ha- haven't cooperated with what you've wanted to do, God, help us to be able to identify those and just respond as Mary did. Yes, Lord, I'm your servant. Do what you want to do. God, if there's areas of our life where we've struggled and we've worried and we've said, God, am I going to mess up your plan? I'm not strong enough. I'm not big enough. I'm not, I'm not good enough. I'm not talented enough. Help us to remember that your plan is accomplished because of your power, not because of ours. So God, wherever we're at this morning, as we prepare to take communion together, may this moment, as we hold a cup of juice and as we hold a, a cracker in our hands, may it, be, may it be a remembrance to us of the power of God to change our lives because of Jesus and how Jesus, you call us to participate and cooperate with you in what you want to do in this world.